because uh, the timing of the early planetary evolution is more or less, or nobody exactly know how to s define the beginning of a planet, and what most geoscientists do is to study uh, the evolution from the time on the planet has have formed a solid surface so it can record, for example, craters and volcanoes and tectonics and all these things which normal geoscientific uh, studies cover. But of course, planetary formation starts at that point when our solar system formed and ideas about planetary formation are quite diverse but generally they co include the formation of the central star and then somehow from the disk, gas disk around or a mixture of dust and uh, gas, it accumulates uh, to or s solidifies and um, produces thicker and larger gas, gas particles in the ecliptic and that's why we have due to the rotation of this um, gas um, dust mixture um, and the, which causes the collapse of a gas cloud around the star that's why we have all the planets in this what we call ecliptic and that is forced due to the rotational motion of the gas cloud which is collapsing around the central star and then of course at one point we form what is known as planetesimals or small bodies they have uh, they, there's a disagreement already in the ideas if they accumulate from du dust slowly by collision and stacking together or if somehow these planetesimals grow, uh, not really grow, but form in quite a big um, chunk of body. And then there you have a couple of papers now called Are Asteroids Born Big? And then you have an opposing paper kind of, no, they grew slowly from dust to, um, to uh, the large, larger version of this. Then, of course, you continue to grow them to our planets, which means that we have uh, the, the flux of these bodies within the disks get smaller and smaller and lesser and lesser particles, so that we form, and that is the traditional way, our planets more or less at the point where we know them by now. We will have then, in the end, uh, so the terrestrial planets further out, uh, further closer to the sun, uh, as we know from Mercury, uh, Venus, Earth and Mars for example and then we have an area which is called the asteroid belt which is, we come back later on and then we have formed the larger objects which have a different composition and they are large enough to uh, accumulate all the, most of the gases around them that's why they're called giant gas planets and that is how our solar system more or less has formed Okay, so what is remaining from this process and why these ideas have been <coughs> formed like this is the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars and from there we believe that uh, the projectiles fly into the inner solar system and sometimes hit them and this hitting was more often in the beginning of the planetary evolution than now. And this uh, flying out, normally if you have rotating or circular, roughly circular orbits, you almost are uh, unable to disturb them enough to move them out of their orbits but because um, there are big bodies like Jupiter, the Sun and also the larger body, um, other gaseous planets they have gravitational interaction with some of these orbits so for example if by accident we have a collision and they jump into these empty spots that's why they are empty because they have some resonance it's called between the orbits of the planets uh, and some other orbits and based on this resonance activity a little gravitational kick is throwing them these bodies which may occupy this kind of orbits so it's always the distance from the Sun here to where it's here Jupiter and that makes the projectiles move at all into the solar system, inner solar system and at all the possibility that objects from here uh, would hit any of our uh, neighbors or even us. These objects which can be uh, produced by this kind of resonances are called near-Earth asteroids 
as soon as they cross or they have different, it's just a definition of how the orbit is and also which distance they can pass within the inner solar system and they have to cross the orbit of the Earth to be at all able to hit the Earth at one point when they coincidentally are in sharing the same point in, in orbits. So that's how we get collision. That we have cratering, we only know from the morphology of the planetary surfaces, but on some points, and these are about 140 about now proven <coughs> impact structures on the Earth, we can at least test and verify that certain morphologies are not volcanic in origin, but have to have some uh, very high pressure uh, affecting the rocks at the surface and they are not uh, possible by normal tectonic processes. So the proof that we have these impact structures on Earth allowed them to infer that many of these features we see on other planets to say that we have a catastrophic impact from a projectile which came from somewhere out of space. And that's the only way uh, how we can assume that it is happening. Then of course you have the theory uh, based on the hafnium tungsten ages, isotope ages for the moon, for example, and also geochemistry of the uh, material of the moon, which suggested then the idea that in the very early times of the formation of solar system, and then we had not yet any um, solid surface on the Earth, and the moon was not even formed, but it is suggested that it formed by a gigantic collision where the ejector was then uh, collected in some point so that we got the moon formed. And there's a, quite recently a couple of papers which suggest that we had even one more moon which collided then with our moon and all these kind of speculations you can uh, consider as funny or realistic. Okay, the surface of the moon now is obviously covered by more or less one morphologic feature, and that's impact craters. Some of them are filled with volcanic uh, material, at least that is the main interpretation. And if we go to very small scale, that is now 200 here, these impact craters continue, and it is obvious that we have a phenomenon which goes over very many sc scales, from about uh, 10,000 uh, kilometer diameter to centimeter scale, and that is um, just reflecting the projectile population, and that is at least what we assume for all our ideas. So, and I gave this talk uh, last week because when we look at my generation, for example, we are kind of second or third generation after some people who were pioneers, and all these ones who had the uh, um, were involved in missions just stepping on the moon or picking up rocks, bringing them home. Of course, they had the, um, the, the advantage of the first sight and of all these things which are uh, included in discovering of new things. But I want to show now that despite their good work, there are still some open questions, and that's why still people like me work on very kind of old-fashioned ideas, and now we want to understand how much smarter we can try to be than our pioneer generation. So the general idea is we have, if we look at the frequency of craters or the amount per square meter against their size, so here's the largest and that is the smallest size observed, we have a certain way of describing this distribution and it's some kind of a uh, showing that the big ones come quite less often than the small ones and it has a certain shape. And this sh shape is believed to have not changed over the entire 4.5 billion years the surface of Mars can record. And with this assumption we infer quite a few more things. So not still to remind you that there's of course quite a few reasons why to study impact cratering and one is of course you can study uh, the if you understand a little bit on earth for example the target properties of other planetary objects which means you can get some strengths or um, um, rheological information just by assuming you understand the process itself 
then you can, of course, identify properties in the subsurface just by the idea that you remove material from, from depths into the ejector outside, and so you can spectrally study if you have some layering or other material buried below the surface. Then, of course, and that will be the main focus of this talk, age determination, and then, of course, if you know the age of a certain morphologic feature, you can understand the evolution on the surface of the planet, and if you then assume certain processes like volcanism, tectonism, you can infer thermal evolution of the body itself as well. Um, to remind you that this, we use this cratering as a clock, and that means that by time you accumulate a number of craters, and then if at one point something happens which resurfaces the uh, some part of the area you will erase part of the craters and then if bombardment continues uh, you will understand that this one per square unit all has an average number of six uh, and maybe the same age when you use then geologic mapping to understand because obviously this one is blue and this one is gray sh should be some different units that this one is about uh, two-fifths uh, younger than the other part. And by this, it's just the way how you determine relative ages, and they are usually constrained, of course, by what you observe in geological mapping. But if you would now look at uh, units far apart where you don't have such a superposition, this relation, of course, is still valid, and then you can compare um, things which happened without any superposition uh, justification. So the procedure is you count the craters on a geological mapped surface and you assume always that you have a certain shape. Um, you have to assume that this distribution or the hitting of the uh, surface is random in time and in space, otherwise this, um, of course, basic assumptions are not true anymore. You have to map correctly and that is most in most of the debates the worst part of when people start fighting about how the real shape looks like. And then, of course, you can call, calculate the aerial density, which gives you the relative uh, time, timing. And then you have to convert into absolute ages if you want to have a time frame which we can use um, to compare with, with the planets each and uh, also what happened on Earth, for example. And this is done by taking uh, landing site samples from the moon. Uh, for example, then here, Apollo 17, 16, and all these ones you know, Luna and 16 and 24 from the Russians. And then you have some younger ones where you infer, due to exactly the superposition um, laws, where which of these uh, units may be represented by some samples you picked up at the landing sites. And based on this, you calculate the crater frequency for these landing site samples because you assume that you have the rock which you picked up being representative for that unit or some other, and you count then the things and the age you determined isotopically here in the, on Earth on the laboratory is then the absolute age and therefore you get this kind of curve and I call it the standard chronology because uh, that is the one which every crater counter is using. It has been developed by quite a number of people in the 70s and still uh, now all these samples have been re or they start to redate these samples and also the assignment with the geological units has been debated for some of this um, landing sites, so there's still a discussion how correct this curve actually is, but that's the only thing we use or have, and almost all of these people have now using or started to use this, at least the shape, even though not the absolute value, so it's kind of the, the crater counter flux evolution. Then, of course, to transfer to other places, we need to understand or assume that we have this crater production which we find on the moon is produced not only on the moon but also on the other terrestrial planets. And then we have some crater scaling laws 
which can then calculate based on different gravity and different velocities of the impact projectiles the same so that we have this crater production function not only for the moon but also for Mars and other planets to really use a calibrated um, absolute age value based on the crater counts we observe on the surface. So as I already told, we have these radiometric ages from, from the moon only. We have some ideas about how the planetary uh, evolution has been going on, which means that at one point uh, we have the end of the planetary formation bombardment and continue with the constant flux. That's uh, one of the ideas. And then, of course, we, need, we can calculate this ratio of impacts of a certain diameter between Mars and Moon and have um, a, a, or assume that we understand then the absolute time frame for Mars as well. And this has been uh, put out in 2001 with all the people who are working with this stuff. So some isotope guys and some other isotope guys, cratering specialists and crater counters. The main point is that in 2001, the data of Mars were not satisfactory to constrain all this. So that was then the lucky hour of the younger generations. So we could do exactly what was missing to confirm, or at least try to confirm that this uh, cook uh, recipe is uh, t actually working. So and the first thing to do then is to study the basin forming events because that is the largest bodies and they are the least frequent and they do not occur anymore now but they have occurred in the early times. So that means we can study how far we look back on the surface by understanding how many craters were there and then we come to that provocative, uh, at least in that group, provocative statement if we had a slow decay in flux or if we had the peak behavior around 3.9 and I will discuss this a little later in more detail. So obviously that is the crater distribution on Mars so we have some areas which are heavily cratered and some areas which are not so much cratered so this is roughly the boundary of um, uh, called dichotomy between heavily cratered highlands and not so much cratered lowlands and then we have a unit here which is the largest volcanic province in the solar system and if we go to uh, one of these examples other of these uh, holes in the crater density distribution are these large impact basins and that were the main focus of the next few slides. So you, you map out some area, count the craters, you get some funny curves which do not look like the ones I showed previously but you can fit at the big ones to get the maximum age some curve part and then you ref derive an age of it. So now it's maybe a little more clear. It's now swapped because nobody can, uh, they, they have also some geography dispute which how you count if 0 to 360 or 180 to 180 so anyway this is this large volcanic province I pointed out and you can immediately see the this uh, line out, outlining the heavily cratered highlands and then the almost crater less lowlands so these circled objects here are the largest ones larger than 250 kilometer in diameter basins and if you do this age determination then you end up with something which looks shown here from 3.4 billion years to 4.3 billion years so we talk in billion and not million or hundreds of thousand years and you see that we have a distribution of ages which are not at all representing a decaying um, distribution as would what we assume from um, the idea of planetary formation. We have of course uh, some meteorites from Mars and that is the famous one which may or may not have contained life and it has been just recently dated newly. It was before considered to be almost 4.5 in crystallization age and 3.9 in some uh, hydrothermal reworking age. Also these shergotites, it's a group of meteorites which have been usually thought to be very young, like 100 million years. 
they have been redated now all to fall roughly about 4.1. So you have a slight problem if you want to constrain your uh, thermal volcanic evolution with this kind of rocks, since obviously dating is a tricky business. Anyway, so also these ones fall only here, and before it was of course easier to say this one tells you the formation of the crust when it was 4.5 billion years ago formed, but now we have some more problems. Okay, as I promised to talk about the early evolution, you can then use, so here I plotted the Shergotite still in the uh, original range, and also uh, this uh, old one in his old position, so they both move now about here. But nevertheless, you can use then some of the large basins to to um, indicate some framing uh, ages for what happened. For example, at one point you had uh, a dynamo which produced a magnetic field on Mars which ceased. So you can use with some speculations exactly this uh, basins for calibrating their timing. Anyway, what is problematic now? Uh, is that we have the crater frequency here and we have our uh, cratering model age here so this scale can always change depending on how you define your um, chronology model but also of course you have the geological interpretation of Mars which means it has nine epochs which are related to crater frequencies at one crater diameter or the other and that, of course, you want to link to an absolute age, and this is the, the biggest variation you have to link a geological epoch finally to an absolute age to make some assumptions of how the planet evolved. Okay, I can skip this because that's much too much detail. So one of the problems is then uh, you can produce out of these assumptions which have been outlined in this mass book uh, isochrons which refer to certain absolute ages and then you can, that was uh, done then in my thesis to constrain whether or not these predictions are correct. So uh, the main uh, uncertainty you have is that you will never find the surface which is representing uh, the entire uh, size frequency distribution because the cratering process and many other geological processes and Mars has an atmosphere uh, is erasing the small ones first and as longer the surface is exposed uh, it will distort the shape of the curve quite dramatically. So to, to constrain or assume that you can constrain this curve you will have to put it together out of all these pieces and there the uncertainty lies already and the same is true for the moon but not to such a strong extent. So the result then is that um, people who work dominantly on Mars like Boris Ivanov, he was here last year and uh, Bill Hartman who is the main crater counter on Mars uh, and also the one who does the geological map, Tanaka they use different shapes of curve. Tanaka, for example, used just an assumption that it's a power law of minus two. That's the black line here. And then Ivanov has sh suggested the red line. That's the one I always use. And then there's the blue line, the not dashed one, which is Hartmann. So you can see that it, it, there are quite some minor variations when you look at it from a statistical point of view, but they are substantially when you do this greater c determination. And that is shown here. So you have these uh, colors, uh, these symbols, which are the defining, at least in the early 80s, defining uh, boundary um, counts. And if you then fit the different curves uh, or different type of curves here, Hartmann and here Ivanov, to this kind of measurements, you will end up with quite a variety of ages, and they are not just a few million years but can be a factor of two as shown here. So there you have some trouble especially if you want to use the prolongation when you go to small scale crater counts. You can end up with very dramatic differences. When we go back to the moon because there all the trouble came from and f ask again what we really know. So we have 
our isotope ages of the returned lunar samples, which are still in progress of redetermination or reinterpretation. Then we have our cratering statistics of the sample representing units. And if you think that your sample is not anymore some mare basalt, but some impact vector, then of course this uh, representing area may change. And then what I tried to tell from the beginning is that we have our conceptual idea how our planetary system has actually formed. And that may make a big difference. So, and to come back, we have produced out of this assumption this uh, standard chronology model, but um, out of the same um, isotope ages and a different interpretation of how um, we assign the uh, source areas. We can have an interpretation which is the one Crater Candas use. It's the blue line. We assume a monotonic flux decay. But if we interpret this kind of isotope age is slightly different, we end up with a very drastic drop down of the planetary formation very close to 4.5 billion years ago, and then have a peak act, uh, event which has been dated to 3.9 billion years by the person who has done all very basic, uh, all the interpretation of the isotope ages in the early times. So, <clears throat> of course, great encounters were very f fixed with the idea that we have this decaying uh, flux because otherwise we will have a very problematic uh, understanding of our crater frequencies if we have wavy um, flux uh, have to uh, uh, assume wavy flux distribution and also that is contradicting the idea that we have a static uh, planetary orbit system which does not allow for such drastic changes in the flux of projectiles but this is now a diagram of a typical diagram of how you describe extrasolar planets um, they are the distance from the Sun against the mass normalized to Jupiter and that here is Jupiter it's, so it's one and one and this are the so far or at that time so far discovered exosolar planets and the problem was compared to our solar system where we assume to have here our that is I think Mercury here then uh, Mars Venus and Earth, they are all very much bigger and f as close or even closer than our uh, known terrestrial, small terrestrial planets. So based on this, they had started to change the idea of the static, dynamically static uh, s planetary system built up as it is now, but that large uh, gaseous planets can move close to the sun, get stopped at one point and move outward again. And by this movement inward and outward you can of course because you change your dynamical system in the uh, solar system easily move these little planetesimals suddenly out or not. So that is what is called so th that is of course as I explained you before very much different than this traditional ideas of how a solar system formed, that you have your bodies exactly at the point where you know them by now. And because of this observation and also the idea that the modelers could in the beginning not really predict how you move a body in to close to the sun without colliding with the sun or further out again without losing it to the outer space, there was a big debate between these two line of interpretation. But finally, all the numerical modelers came together in NICE, that's why it's called NICE model and not NICE. Uh, they were producing a set of uh, orbital evolution models which could explain the orbital migration of uh, gaseous planets, so they move in and because of their own um, gravitational forces and because you have still material from the in this ecliptic disk 
which hasn't disappeared, they can be stopped and then forced to move backwards again. And that has different episodes. And one of these episodes allows then, or generally the migration of big planets allows then also the migration of the planetesimals and they are suddenly chaotic moving at one point. This could then explain uh, the, this p peak bombardment at a certain point of time and this certain point of time is depending how much planetesimals you put outside of the solar system boundary uh, beyond Pluto. So you can make with some tricks exactly this uh, scenario which has been described based on isotope geochemistry by the findings of Terra and others. So then of course we should stop discussing but of course there are few who are stubborn and a few who are not believing in what is going on so the main cause of this debate is to constrain this possible um, detected peak in the greater frequency as well. And this problem, or there is a problem because there's the same people as on the moon have derived within the past uh, 30 years different shapes of this distribution. And if you use these different shapes of distribution, uh, you will, and you use a fitting, you will get different ages for the same observation. Uh, usually people then say, but why don't we look at asteroids? That w should be the source and that should be explaining everything, so we add just another confusion. And we of course have no uh, clear understanding. This is from here on roughly a model as well. So we have no observation and then this all con uh, doesn't help very much. So what the effect is that if you use the Neukomm curve, you get a 4.6. If you use the um, the old Neukomm curve, if you use the new Neukomm curve, you get a younger age, and if you use the Hartmann curve, you get an even younger age, given the same uh, chronology model you translate. So it's uh, just a matter of how you fit it to the same distribution, and it's always anchored to the one kilometer diameter, so you have some slightly problems. Um, the same for the oldest unit, exactly the same observation. You have uh, very high ages with the old Neukomm, with the new you have intermediate, and with the Hartmann you have some even younger. So you have conflict o all over. When you now try to compare, because you, you, your only way to dis uh, distinguish now what actually happened is if there was a late heavy bombardment or heavy bombardment, it should be at least synchronous on Moon and Mars. And I showed you before in red what is now in gray, my measurements on the Moon, uh, on Mars. Then there have been some old measurements uh, in that time and there was already conflict between shapes but now of the distribution. But now there's a new data set which has been measured on uh, laser altimeter, so topographic data, and if you fit there, you can have a best fit, which takes the entire range of the measurement, or you can assume an oldest fit. So these are the two different blue and black in comparison to the gray, and that makes you really unhappy because there's absolutely no synchronicity at all anymore. So the main point is that either something with the transferring the the, the crater distribution from Moon to Mars is wrong or something with the chronology model or something with the general idea is wrong. So then you can go into little details. This is, these squares are the originally definition for the large part, uh, largest part of crater diameters and now it's plotted uh, with assuming the deviation from a minus three distribution and minus three distribution is flat like this, and that shows only the deviation, so the, the uh, error compared to uh, simple power law. And it is also showing the difference between many measurements. So the black one was the one which was used to define the curve. The blue one, and you see quite some substantial difference because it's logarithmic scale, is the one which we used for determining the basin ages on the moon. 
this red one is one of my counts and so obviously there's also something wrong in the top part if we assume that this is the correct curve. So we have to do a lot to verify this. I pointed this out already that this little difference makes enormous difference in how you assign the ages and also how you use this chronology model into translating exactly these absolute ages. And then of course you can test the, the amount and I guess that is a little too, too technical now because mainly is that you used the old curve for calibrating your chronology model. And if you change your uh, crater production function and fit again the observations, you will end up with a different uh, calibration data set for your chronology model. So already there you have, if you mix these things, you already introduce quite a substantial error into your absolute ages by having different frequencies. And if you compare then with what you can observe, so these different curves are now changed to the one which the Nice model is using because they don't go to very small projectiles, but they at least um, use projectiles of one kilometer as smallest, and that is a roughly a crater diameter of 20 kilometer, and then you can start to compare what you see in the Nice model and in the uh, real observation. So we, as we have a maximum crater frequency on the surface measured which is roughly here. We have uh, these two different curves and these are two calibration points from the Nice model. So generally we have quite some good agreement uh, which of course it's also trimmed to result in this kind of agreement uh, of these two points and that is usually the Nectaris Basin Formation and the Imbrium Basin Formation and then we have of course an age range of 4.1 to the beginning and also between the frequency they predict to what we really observe what we can use to, to fix our hole here while definitely this Nice model doesn't assume such a flux like this. So that could be possible steps to test but last week I discussed and this and that will not really help unless we have really some good constraints on on how the shape is and if this shape is not time dependent because we as crater counters assume that this is stable with time and then of course if we go to Mars we have the same problem the same variety we have an even greater variety of chronology models uh, and they always, so you have from here to here for the same crater frequency much younger ages and that is what I leave you with. <laughs>